Among the Hudson's Museum's holdings are collections that present the artistic traditions of the Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot peoples. This exhibit focuses on brown ash and sweetgrass baskets, birch bark work, carving, and decorative traditions. The objects on exhibit date from the early 1800s to the present. To complement this program, please explore the app that the museum created for this gallery. You'll find the app on our website's education page. Select the button for Museum App. Also, please visit the museum's YouTube channel and watch contemporary Wabnaki artists talk about how they learned and continue to carry on these ancient traditions and concerns they have about the perpetuation of their art for future generations from climate change and invasive insect pest changing attitudes to land use and access. Wabnaki creation legends tell of Gluskabe shooting an arrow into the brown ash tree. The tree splits open and the people emerge from the tree. Basket making is Maine's most ancient artistic tradition and brown ash is central to this art form. Brown ash grows in wet areas along the banks of streams, rivers, and brooks. It has unique properties. When harvested and then pounded with the back of an axe, it splits along the tree's growth rings, producing strips of material that are extremely pliable and can be straped and split into pieces to make baskets. Tools used to make baskets include wooden blocks or molds to ensure that baskets are uniform in shape and size, gauges with sharp teeth that cut a single strip of material into multiple widths, and crooked knives which are used to carve handles and sturdy basket rims. Wabnaki people made baskets to carry, store, and gather items. One of the earliest forms is the pack basket. This basket was designed to fit in a canoe, and today these sturdy baskets are a must for ice fishing and trekking in the woods. After contact, Wabnaki people began to make baskets for sale to settlers, who prized them for their sturdiness and utility. The sale of baskets was a major source of income. With the development of Maine's tourist industry in the mid-19th century, Wabnaki communities travels to Maine's coasts, and inland to lakes and resorts to sell baskets and other novelty goods. The baskets on exhibit date from the 1850s to the present. Over time, styles, the addition of other materials such as sweetgrass and Hong Kong cord, and colors change to meet the demands of consumers and design trends. Baskets were used in the home to store just about anything. Let's look at some of the forms here. From the 1800s to the mid-1900s, nearly every individual in these communities was involved in some aspect of basket making, from harvesting brown ash and pounding and preparing splints, to braiding and gathering sweet grass, to actually weaving a basket. Many hands worked to create baskets. With the Depression and World War II in the 1930s and 1940s, tourism declined and the ability to sell baskets became limited. New materials such as plastic took the place of natural materials and with the loss of markets, there was little incentive to make baskets. In the 1980s, there was a recognition that basket making was central to Wabnaki culture. Elders who were keepers of the tradition worked to pass it on to a new generation and today, Wabnaki artists are recognized for their artistry. Here are some contemporary works made by this new generation of basket makers. Birch bark was the fabric of life, used to create shelter, moose calls, torches, containers of all shapes and sizes, and canoes. Harvested from the paper birch, birch bark is waterproof, insect resistant, and has no odor and can be cut, shaped, and folded. Bark harvested in the summer has a lighter inner bark color, while the winter bark's inner surface is a rich dark brown and can be etched with a sharp implement to create designs. Let's explore the wigwam. Why does it have a hole in the center? 
The frame of the wigwam is made from saplings and bark panels are sewn together with spruce root and attached with basswood lashings, much like a modern tent. Here are examples of birch bark containers. Some are decorated with elaborate porcupine quill designs. Others are etched with scenes from everyday life or mythical beings in double curve designs. Some of the etch work on exhibit was done by Toma Joseph, who lived from 1837 to 1914. Toma Joseph was a Passamaquoddy artist and fishing and hunting guide. He created a wide variety of birch bark art forms decorated with distinctive etched motifs, including hunting and camp scenes and imagery from Passamaquoddy tales. Central to this area of the gallery is a birch bark canoe made in 1888. This 19-foot canoe, a river canoe, was made for Charles Strickland, a prominent Bangor businessman for lumber drives. Made from thinner summer bark, it was designed for speed. The seams are sewn with spruce root and then pitched. Canoe building requires the gathering of materials, a single sheet of blemish-free birch bark from a massive paper birch tree, spruce root for lashing the bark to the boat's frame, maple to create the frame, the gunnels and thwarts, and cedar for the canoe's ribs, and pine pitch to make the entire boat waterproof. It takes about two weeks to build a canoe from start to finish, and many hands help with the project from carving each of the ribs and frame elements to lashing the bark covering over the frame and pitching the canoe, all before it's ready to launch into the water. You'll also need canoe paddles for your canoe. These vessels are amazing. They are light and agile and float like a leaf on the water. If taken care of and repaired, they'll last a lifetime. 90% of Maine is covered in trees, providing habitat for wildlife. Trees and plants provide wood, bark, and roots for creating material culture. Herbs, berries, and nuts are important foodstuffs and ingredients for medicines. The most important tool for carving is the crooked knife. This one-handed draw knife is used to make canoes, paddles, snowshoes, wooden bowls, bows and arrows, and many other objects. Here is an example of Waltis, a northeastern bowl game. You'll find directions on how to make a replica of this game and instructions for playing this game on our website. We hope that you'll create a game of your own and try this game of chance. Snowshoes weren't just for winter recreation. They were essential to getting around from place to place in the winter. Making snowshoes was a life skill. Frames were made from maple, and they were filled in with webbing made from caribou and later from moose and deer rawhide. Snowshoes use physics. They allow you to distribute your weight over a larger surface area, allowing you to walk on the snow, not sink into it. Root clubs are made from gray birch and poplar, which grows in bogs. Saplings with root balls are harvested from the bog. Branches and leaves are removed, leaving the tree's stock and roots. The carver releases the spirits in the roots, pointing some of them and carving others into animals and birds. These objects were traditionally used as a weapon. Over time, they have been used for ceremonies and were sold to tourists. Today, carvers continue to carry on this tradition. In this gallery, you'll find two portraits, one of Molly Molasses and one of her daughter, Sarah, dressed as Penobscot women would have been in the mid-1800s. Molly's wearing a peaked cap, her daughter, Sarah, a beaver top hat with trade silver hat band. Both wear brooches that were given by colonial powers as part of diplomacy to indicate allegiance. Sarah is also wearing a wampum bead necklace. Wampum was made by hand from quahog shells. It was highly valued in the Northeast and was used as a medium of exchange and diplomacy. It was passed down within families for generations. The decorative traditions of the Northeast include ornately beaded regalia and clothing forms featuring both medicine plants and double-curved designs. 
Cape collars and cuffs were part of regalia worn by men for diplomacy, inauguration of chiefs and governors, and special community events. These were treasured pieces that were passed down from one generation to the next. Other items were made for sale outside the community, such as these beaded bags, many of which were sold by other Northeastern groups, especially around the Niagara Falls area, and were bought back by visitors to that region. In Maine, beadwork was largely reserved for use by community members and was not generally sold outside Wabanaki communities. You will also see other examples of traditional designs on powder horns, used to store gunpowder for early muskets, and other containers. Here is an example of another weaving tradition done with basswood. This basswood bag uses a weaving material that weavers may turn to again in the future as brown ash is threatened by the emerald ash borer and climate change. Only a fraction of the Hudson Museum's Wabnaki collections are on exhibit. We invite you to explore Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, and Micmac collections on our public access database. The link to the database may be found on the museum website collection page. We invite you to explore these collections online.